This is Rudy Giuliani, and I am here with a truly, truly great hero. Someone that I've admired for many, many years. Someone whose um, history just <laughs> sings out freedom. This man has devoted his life, to putting his life at risk to fight for freedom. And it's Felix Rodriguez. Felix was a colonel in the United States government. And, uh, you know, I'm going to let him tell his life, but with what's going on in Cuba right now and the confusion uh, as to some, as to what is actually involved, I, I don't think there's anyone we could talk to that would have more of an insight into it than, than, than Felix, because he's devoted his life to fighting for freedom and liberty for his countrymen in Cuba. And then he's extended that to other parts of the globe, including for his now his new country, the United States of America. Felix, I, I have to tell you, I've met a lot of people and uh, this is one of the most, uh, this, is one of the, this is one of the highlights to me. Thank you, Major. You're a great hero. It's a pleasure to be with you. You've devoted your life to um, just, just fighting for freedom. So let's, let's go back to how it, it, all, it all started. Where, where were you born? Well, I was born in Cuba mm -hmm. in 1941. Uh, then I came to this country back in 1954 for high school. Why did you come to the U.S. Uh, for high school? Well, uh, an uncle of mine really uh, was offered by my other uncle to uh, pay my studies in the United States. And an old uncle who had a study in France told me, say, look, that's an opportunity that should not uh, oversee. Well, you, will be, you will regret if you don't do it. So I accepted. So I came when I was uh, 14 years old in Pennsburg, Pennsylvania. Where'd you go? What school was it? Per, per Kiyom and Prem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I spoke no English. So it was very, very difficult at the beginning, the first two years, it was seventh and eighth grade, by science and all of that. Finally, I started getting uh, to speak English and I finally graduated in 1960. But before, in 1959, I heard there was something going on. So today. this is all during the time great change is happening in you your were, country, right? Yes. There was, didn't Castro first make an attempt a few years earlier and fail? Yes, that's when he went and attacked the Moncada. That's on the 26th of July, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. uh, the 26th of July, uh, what year? Oh, that was uh, uh, in the 50s. Yeah, in, the, in like the mid-50s. Right? right, in the mid-50s. So he, he tried that. Uh, they actually assassinated a lot of soldiers. Uh, he was put in prison, and Batista released him in December. Then he went to Mexico uh, with a group of other uh, Cubans, and that's where Che Guevara joined him there. And then they invaded Cuba, uh, the Sierra Maestra. And eventually, because the United States stopped all the weapon shipment to Batista, uh, he had, Batista had to leave and he just took over the, the regime. So this is all happening while you're in New Jersey, getting an education. Pennsylvania. Right? And were you, were you back in Pennsylvania? So this is all happening when you were in Pennsylvania. Right. And uh, you were, go were you going back and forth to Cuba? Uh, oh, yes. On, for the holidays? Oh, yes. And the way since since 1954, it went about four times every year. Every year there was a week or more on vacation, I would fly to Cuba. That's so true. until 1959, when he took over, I never came back again. I came back, but you're in the Bay of Pigs. So did you see it coming? Was it, did your family, your father, your, your relatives, did they see Castro eventually taking over the country? Well, they saw that he was communist. And one of the few people who really were aware that he was going to be communist. They saw he was communist oh, before yes. he took over. Before he I took don't over. think people will remember that for the first year or two, there was some doubt as to whether he was a communist or not. There was, no, he denied. He he said that he was not right. a communist to the general to the world in general. But. Until he was able to grab the power in Cuba. When he did, then he declared himself Marxist, Marxist Leninist. But you or your family knew from the very beginning that right. he that he was a committed communist. Right. As was Guevara. Right. And the people around him. Mm -hmm. So now you're in school, and you find out that. Um, Castro has taken over. Batista has Batista fled on what, December 31st, 1958, if I recall correctly. It was uh, December, yeah. 30, right. well, December last day, 31st, last day of the year. We probably remember it right. because of the scene in The Godfather. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when everybody's running out on New, on New Year's Eve. But in any event, uh, so now Batista's gone. Castro's in charge. What's happening with you in, in school? You're a 17-year-old 17, 17 now? At that time, I was even less than that. But then, when I was yeah, when I was seventeen, I started looking at the firing squad that was taking place in my homeland, 
<laughs> it was it, it was uh, it, it was something ridiculous. Uh, they had really no defense. Uh, I saw the case of Sosa Blanco, where the witness who was going to tell the tribunal that Sosa Blanco have killed his brother, appointed at the prosecutor and told the prosecutor, "You killed my brother." He had to be told, "No, it's the guy next to him." So it was ridiculous. It was no no. How many how many of these um, how many of these what would you call them uh, sham trials took place? There were hundreds. Wonder of them. That's why I decided we had to do something about it. That's and, why and I was accepted at the university and arrived in Miami, and I learned that there was something to, to do, up, you know, against Fidel. That's why I joined the, the Bay of Pigs. Were you learning these facts uh, from your family, from students, from your father? Who was telling you? Because you're, you're in the United States, and they're telling you about how Castro basically is slaughtering people. And, um, and he's, whatever he had thought before, he, he turns out right, right from the very beginning to be a monster. Yeah, but it was in American television. I was looking at a lot of those things in American television. Oh, so you picked that up. American television. Oh, absolutely. American television covered things like yes. that were even unfavorable to communism. Yes, at that time. At that time. Now, yes. if it's, yeah. But in any event, in any event, you become aware of the fact there's a tremendous amount of, that basically this Castro has become a tyrant. Right. And you're living under a tyranny. And so where are you in school now? Well, I was just before graduating when I went to the Dominican Republic, and after that... Well, why did you go to the Dominican Republic? Well, I was in Mexico visiting my parents in, in 19, uh, early 1959, and there was a captain by the name of Cortez who came from the Dominican Republic to recruit former military people that were in Mexico. Uh, I knew a lot of those military people. I was friends with them, and even though I was much younger than they were. Uh, when they started recruiting, I volunteered. And you were too young, weren't you? Yeah, 17. And what did you do? So that's when uh, you tell us I wanted you to go. I, no, I told the guy I wanted to go. He said, fine, you need a visa. And that's when they had to go. And, and since I was 17, my father had to sign uh, an application. So when I brought it to him, he said, look, you are too young. I don't want to sign it because I might be signing your death sentence. So I said, all right, I am going to sign it for you. For you. So he said, well, I'll respect that. And I did it in front of him, but I would not sign. So in front of him, I pulled Ismael Rodriguez. I got my visa. And on the fourth, actually, on the 4th of July, I flew from Miami to Dominican Republic. On the 4th of July? Yes. And that was for training? That was training to go to Trinidad, and a city that was taken then by, supposedly by the rebels uh, in our favor. It turned out that it was Fidel troops who did that. And I was very lucky, but when the helicopter came to pick up about five of us to go there uh, to Trinidad, I was one of the ones that was picked up. But then there was another friend of mine, Martin Perez, who was older than I was, and his father got to the helicopter and said, you are too young, my son has more experience, so he got me out of the helicopter. And his son has spent the next 28 years in a Cuban prison. He just died a few weeks ago. I'm sorry. So I was a lot lucky. of stories like that, huh? A yeah. lot of a lot of that in your life. Yes. Uh, and uh, family members killed by Castro and no, fortunately none of them. Friends. None of my family. Friends. Friends, yes. So you're now you're now in the military. What military? What, what military are, are you in at this point? No, no, after the Bay of Pigs, actually. No, no, I, but what's before the Bay of Pigs? No, before the Bay of Pigs, I was in no military. You were trained, though? No, uh, uh, well, when in the Bay of Pigs, I was trained. So then how did that come about? Then after How, the, how did you find out about the Bay of Pigs? It was, it was well, top, in Miami, it was, it was top secret. For when, when we were in Miami, there was already the, by voice that there was some area that you can go and get uh, recruited. So a friend of mine already knew about that play. He told me about it. Well, we went together and we got recruited. Thank you. We'll be back in just a few minutes. How much equity do you have in your home? 50,000, 100,000, more? Cybercrime experts are alerting homeowners that the more equity you have, the greater the chance foreign and domestic criminals will come after you. Title theft is one of the fastest growing crimes. Home Title Lock, America's leader in home title protection, is alerting homeowners. They could already be a victim and not know it. Here's how it goes down. First, cyber thieves search hundreds of public databases for high equity homes. Next, they pull your home's title that's online. They forge your signature stating you sold your home and they take out loans using your equity. You're not covered by insurance. Your bank or common identity theft programs protect your most valuable asset. Register your address now to see if you're already a victim and receive a complete title history of your home. 
a $100 value free. Go to HomeTitleLock.com. That's HomeTitleLock.com. Welcome back to our interview with Felix Rodriguez. So it was top secret, but it wasn't that top secret. No, no. People knew about it. So that's how we joined. So did a lot of young Cuban-Americans uh, uh, join? Yes. And wh where did that training take place? Well, it took place. The original one was taking place in, in Guatemala. Then as time went by during that year, uh, the end of, the, of 1960, uh, they sent us to what well, the special, uh, special Forces, the Brigade, I was part of that, uh, to Panama for additional in, uh, training. And after that, we came back to, to Miami to infiltrate Cuba. Actually, when we were in, in, in Panama, I and a friend of mine, Segundo Borges, volunteered to kill Castro. So when we got to Miami, they accepted the operation and uh, they gave us uh, one rifle, a very powerful rifle with 20 rounds of ammunition, only need very few. And uh, we tried to infiltrate Cuba. Actually, the boat that we used we were, it was a beautiful yacht. And we were told that it belonged to Sergeant Schreifer, a relative of President Kennedy. So you, you went in a couple of days before, though, didn't you? A little before. No, we, I went in actually in February, late February. And then the, and the actual invasion was, was when? 17th of April. So you were, you were there for, for quite some time oh, before yeah. working with the resistance. Your purpose was what, intelligence and organization, right? Bringing in weapons and explosives and everything to the island. And you were not uh, detected uh, during that period. No, it was lucky. We were close sometimes, but we were lucky that never were, were detected. And you were able to communicate back to Miami. Yes, we had radio operators that communicated back to the base here in Miami. Uh, like I said, I, and then when the whole thing failed, I was lucky that the lady who was driving me had contact with the Spanish well, embassy. So be nobody better to ask this question. Why did it fail? Well, uh, the air support. First of all, the original operation was not a landing. The original operation was on the Eisenhower administration when President Eisenhower was told in 1960 uh, that they were planning to bring offensive missiles into the Cuba. He ordered the CIA to destabilize the Castro regime. And that's when they started an operation that was nothing to do with the landing. It was a colonel graduated from West Point Napoleon Valeriano, who used the name of Vallejo from uh, Philippine origin, who have been very successful against the hawk of the Philippines. And he started three groups called the, the, the um, infiltration team, then they have the black teams and the occupational force. His idea was to promote a guer guer guerrilla warfare in the Escombra, who already had people in there, to extend that there were a lot of people recruits in there, then bring the black team that were highly trained in training, in receiving These would be like our special forces. Yeah. Uh, we were regarded as special no, we forces. were before the special forces bringing people into the mountain. When that right. happened, this, these people were very good in paramilitary operation. They were supposed to be, be able to receive weapons by air and then and by, by sea. And once we had enough people on their arm to secure a small area, they would bring the rest of the brigade with a, with a powerful radio station and a provisional government, civilian provisional government, offering a free election and democratic election within a year. And the idea was that that would be recognized by the OAS, U.S., and that's the end of Castro. Now, when did the plan change to, uh, obviously this infiltration from within didn't go, didn't go on uh, from the length, for the length of time it was supposed to. Well, we had the elections in November, and then the Eisenhower administration was out with Nixon, and Kennedy came in. So Kennedy decided to continue with the operation, but he didn't want to go with an operation that was designed by the Republicans. So first of all, he tried to, which was not too bad, to take the city of Trinidad and do the same thing that they were planning to do with the radio station, all of that. But at the end, they told him that it was uh, very difficult to deny the U.S. participation because there would be a lot of press in the area, which is ridiculous. Nobody can believe that a group of exiles could amaze tanks, planes, and troops like that. But nevertheless, they convinced the president like that, and they terminated the, the operation for Trinidad, and they went to the Bay of Pigs. And they went to the Bay of Pigs instead. Right. But and the Bay of Pig, we had to control the air to be successful, and they knew that. So the first airstrike that took place eliminated 90% of Castro's Air Force. But then the, the remaining planes were going to be eliminated on the following day with 16 planes. Then Adelaide Stevens from the United Nations uh, was presented proof because the administration was saying those were planes from Castro attacking target and then leaving to the United States. But then the Cuban government showed proof that there were different planes, that the one from Cuba had a, a, a plastic nose and the one attacking there were metal nose with a 50 color machine gun nose. So at last even told his administration, unless they put a stop to the airstrike, he will resign to the UN. And to be able to keep him in there, they put a stop to the airstrike, they controlled the air and they sank the boat. They with, mean the, Cu the Cuban government controlled yes, the air. Yes, controlled the air. And they were able to sink the boat with all the ammunition, everything that was to, to so the So the change was made during the operation. Right. 
When, when, no, before the operation. Well, Kennedy the, was the one who took the decision to, to land at the Bay of Pigs. No, but then, was that supposed to be with air support? Right. So after the, the landing of the Bay of Pigs, as far as the people that landed, they would have expected there'd be air support. Yeah, they were told that, yes. And you thought there'd be air support? Yes. And you were, on, and you were in the interior? I went in, in Havana at the time. You, so you, you had been there for some time. Right. So then it, it, you have the first day, the second. Day. When, it, when was the decision made to cut off air support? There'd be no air support. Well, if, before that, that, the, that attack that was supposed to take place with 16 planes was the one who would have stopped because of the Lyle Stevenson attitude. And during that time, that's when they destroyed the boat that was carrying all the ammunition, the fuel, everything, the radio station. And there was not a contingency plan to, see, to, uh, to actually resupply the brigade. So they fought like tigers for 24 hours, they accomplished every single target they were given on 24 hours, but then the ammunition they had for 24 hours, they extended for 40 days, and when they ran out of ammunition, they had to run into the sun. So they ran out of ammunition, it wasn't, it wasn't resupplied. Right. And the air support they were supposed to get, after have. after how long were they gonna get the air support? Were they, were, we never continue? got it. It was supposed to happen from the very beginning? Right, but never happened. It never happened at all. There was at no all. air support no. at all. And they had a Task Force Alpha in front of the Bay of Pigs. They had the USS carrier Essex in standing by, and they had painted black all the names of the U.S. Navy. They were ready to go, but the president never gave the okay. So the, the men involved in this must, must have felt, felt double-crossed. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I remember. I remember in at the ways. time. I remember at the time. So now, how do you, how do you get how do you get out of Cuba after this happens? Well, when 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 that happened, it was a tremendous uh, problem to survive in the cities, because what what Castro did was he sent his troops and they surrounded every single block in Havana. And if you were a male, and if you were not connected with a military unit, they would put you in temporary concentration camp, like they were baseball baseball field with two hundred thousand Cubans in there. And so, so like, everybody that wasn't part of Castro's army or, or right. team was regarded, uh, was presumed to be guilty. Right. And they put everybody Until in... Until they could find out. But they were able to disarticulate the internal resistance. They were, they, they were able to do that. I was lucky that the lady that was with me had contact with the Spanish embassy. So one member of the Spanish embassy came where we were and said, look, they're, they're coming to surround this house. So we went with him, hiding his apartment, and then I seek political asylum in the Venezuelan embassy, which I spent like six months before they allowed to, to me to leave as a political <laughs> Very <outside>. different Venezuela. <laughs> oh, yes. A very different Venezuela. It was Venezuela. different totally. You wouldn't go to the Venezuela. No, today, <laughs> today it would turn me over. <laughs> so how long did you stay in the embassy? Six months. Before you came to the, to the, right. to the U.S. or to Venezuela? Before I, I got to Venezuela on the 13th of September. And then you came to the And then I came to the United States after six months. And within a month, I was back into Cuba with a team uh, to be able to bring in and out in, in another point. Uh, so I went to Cuba about six times with an infiltration team with people, ammunition, things like that, after the Bay of Pigs. Uh, never detected? Hmm? Never detected by them when you did this? No, no. And what were, you, and what were the purpose of those, those others? Well, they were reestablishing the contact with the resistance inside and also bring some equipment there. But that was in a different, completely different area. It was in an area in Cayo Paredon Grande, which is on the north coast of Cuba. And we contacted with a farmer, uh, a fisherman inside that will come up in his boat who was legal, uh, pick up the weapon, hide it, and then go back inside Cuba. Now, uh, tell us about um, the situation in Bolivia, how, how you got involved, how you got involved in that. Well, I got a call from, uh, from a CIA officer, Larry Sternfield. He wanted to meet with a group of us, 16 of us here in Miami. And then when, we didn't even know that Che Guevara was in Bolivia at the time. So he interrogated and in, in, interviewed all of us, and then he selected two to go. And I asked him, you know, because we basically had, all of us had the same training. as why do you select me? He said, well, you told me at the end. At the end of every interview, he will tell you, if I select you, when will you be ready to be mobilized? And everybody would tell him, I need a week, or a few days, whatever. My answer was, if we have time, I'll go to my house, I go back to my wife, my kids, pick up my, my, my clothes, I'll come back and we'll leave. If we don't have time for that, you give me the phone, I call Rosa and tell her I have to leave. If we don't have time, let's go and I'll give you her number and you tell her that I have to leave. I guess nobody have told him that. That's why he selected me. So did you know what it was for? Yes, at that time he told me that Che Guevara was well, gonna We're going to take a short break and then we're going to find out about, this is probably another one of the more, more important things he did for us. Thank you. We'll be back in just a few minutes. I accomplished a lot in 2020, exposing the truth, establishing the relationship with you, working tirelessly for America and I came to know the work and value of the people 
at American Hartford Gold. You see, you buy gold not only for what you know, but you buy gold for what you don't know. American Hartford Gold is the company you can trust when it comes to buying gold. They sell physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or inside of your IRA. In the precious metals industry, they are the highest rated firm in our country with an A plus from the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied clients. Give them a call and tell them Rudy sent you and be sure to ask them what I bought. And if you call them right now, they will give you up to $1,500 of free silver on your first order. Folks, these are uncertain times. The one thing you can count on to protect what you have worked so hard for is physical gold and silver. So don't wait. Call them now. Call 833-GOLD-777. That's 833-GOLD-777. Or text RUDY to 65532. Again, that's 833-GOLD-777. Or text RUDY to 65532. Welcome back to our interview with Felix Rodriguez. As you can tell, this is a exceptional this is an exceptional life. And um, we're only just begun. So after the after the Bay of Pigs, uh, Felix, and before the Bolivia uh, situation, so you're you're called upon to go in and out of Cuba on a fairly almost seems like a fairly regular basis to do, to do things. Right. I did it for a while. Uh, before Bolivia, I also went to, to uh, actually to Venezuela uh, to help the, uh, set up communication for Casadores, what the special anti-guerrilla unit that was operating against a group of Castro's uh, guerrilla have landed in there. And then after Venezuela, that's, that's when I went to... Uh, so, now, so now they call upon you for this other mission in Bolivia. You get picked for the mission, as you explained to us. Right. Do they explain to you before they pick you what the mission was in Bolivia? Yes, they explained basically that it was an operation that they believe Che Guevara was there. They already had sent a special forces unit to train a special military unit that they had not that capability. And they wanted to send the, the intelligence capability to that special battalion. So this was like what we would relate to bin Laden, going, uh, get, trying to get bin Laden. Sort of. So so, uh, so now you get selected with another, another gentleman right. for the intelligence mission. Right. And then what happens? Do you have to go for training at this point, or? Yeah, but they brought us to Washington D.C. to a safe house uh, to give us to read everything related to the guerrilla, the the people that formed the guerrilla, what was going on in there, and specifically they told me, by any chance uh, you were able to capture Che Guevara alive, try to keep me keep him alive at all costs, and we will have helicopter whatever to take him out of Bolivia to Panama for interrogation. That was very very clear to me. So the idea was. Uh, to see if to see if he can get intelligence from. Him. I mean, you know, un, un, maybe unlikely, but still a possibility. You never know, right? Right. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, you never know if a person's going to, at that point in life, are they going to talk? Aren't they going right. to talk? And he would have been a quite a resource. Although, don't you think it's unlikely? That, the, the, you that know, the would would have the main uh, the main reason the CIA one the main reason the CIA wanted him alive was because he had problems with Fidel Castro. Uh, che was pro-Chinese, and Cuba depended solely on the Soviet Union. So when he went in the 60s, 64, 65 to Africa, to the Congo, Belga, all the weapons that he received was from Red China. He didn't receive anything from the Soviet Union. And when he finished, it was a failure there. He didn't want to go back to Cuba. He went to Prague, to the Czech Republic, uh, and then they had to send people to convince him to go back to Cuba and then offer him this operation in, in Bolivia. But you can tell from the beginning they, they wanted him to be executed. For example, uh, they meaning Cuba, Fidel specifically. The radio that they gave him to transmit back to Cuba is only one. Normally, there would be more than one in case it goes bad. And when he arrived in Bolivia, it didn't work. It was broken. On the 31st of December of 1966, Mario Monge, the head of the Communist Party, met with, uh, with Che. And he had met with Fidel two months before in Havana. And he retrieved all the support from the Communist Party from Che to, to, the, to the point to tell the people from the Communist Party that were with him that they stay with Che, they would be expelled. Uh, from, from the Communist Party. And there was a Cuban officer who was very well known, who was established himself uh, in La Paz to be able to help, uh, to help Che in there. He's the one who received him and 17 other Cubans, uh, Renan Montero. 
And once Che was inside with everybody, they recalled him with the pretext that his visa had expired. And this guy had acquired the, the Bolivian citizenship. Well, I mean, these were very shrewd people. So Castro obviously ordered that. Oh, yeah. That's not going to happen without no. Castro knowing all the details of it. Right. So he wanted to get rid of his old pal. Yeah, because he, he depended on the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union didn't want him to be successful. So do you, do you, do you, do you, what, was it the Soviets that was pre pressuring Castro to get rid of him? Yeah, because the, the Che was pro-Chinese, and the Soviet and the Chinese hate each other. Yeah, and now Che, this is a very shrewd guy also. He doesn't pick up this. He gets sent there with only one phone. The phone doesn't work. Or he learned that when he got He's there. Getting, everybody's supposed to be there. Right. All of a sudden, disappears. <laughs> right. It's like you know when the mafia takes you uh, to, to the uh, to, to the uh, to the uh, the woods. You drive into the woods with the mafia. You know what's going to happen, right? Right. So, so you get there, and then what, tell us what happens. Well, I start working with the S Division headquarters. There was already in La Esperanza and Old Sugar Mill uh, a group of Bolivian soldiers from the Second Ranger Battalion being trained by Papi Shelton, who was a major uh, from Tennessee, uh, from a group of special forces, what they call MTT, Mobile Training Team, to set up and train this battalion operation. And I went to work directly with the head of the Ace Division at the headquarters, uh, Colonel Centeno uh, Anaya, uh, to help them in intelligence. So I was the personal advisor to Major Saucedo, who was the head of intelligence. Whenever they capture a prisoner, they called me to go with him to interrogate them. And this was an attempt for communists to overthrow Bolivia. Absolutely. This was part of what the original mission for Castro was to spread communism all through the region. Absolutely. Which actually turns out to have been a failure. T totally. But I mean, his idea, they were, he was going to spread uh, first in uh, Central America, then in Northern South America, and then in right. and Venezuela was one of the places they were trying to do it. But, well, that's what they selected Bolivia, because Bolivia had boundaries with five different countries. He was successful there. They could go to Brazil, they could go to Paraguay. They go to Argentina, Chile, and Peru. So how did the confrontation with, uh, with uh, Che come about? Well, first of all, they had no idea where he was. But then I they were able to capture one Bolivian guerrilla called Paco, Jose Castillo Chavez. And he was brought in alive. And I was able to save his life. They were ready to kill him. Uh, with, uh, with the general, I was able to save his life and to give it to us for interrogation. And Paco gave us all the, the information on how Che would move around in the field. Whenever he moved from point A to point B, he divided his guerrilla in three groups, what they call the vanguard, the center, and the rear guard. The vanguard is like five or six guerrilla that will move one kilometer ahead of him. And then he, with the groves of the troops, he was in the middle, and then one kilometer behind another five or six guerrilla. In case there was an encounter, he will be able to maneuver out of it. So in late September, there was a, a, a firefight between a, a army unit commanded by Eduardo Galindo uh, Granchant, and he was able to kill three members of the vanguard. And they happened to be Coco Peredo, the leader of the guerrilla, Mario Gutierrez Jardalla, who was a Bolivian doctor, and the other one was Miguel, a Cuban captain whose name was Manuel Hernandez Osorio. And we had him already cataloged as member of the vanguard. So he had lost three of his people. Right. Three but, of his but then people. we know we, we, that he was there because uh, the, the Lieutenant Galindo tell me, mi Capitan, I saw uh, a, gr a, a group of guerrilla and I started preparing my ambush and they surprised me. When the, what he saw actually was Che Guevara's group, but the vanguard was already coming up the the hill. You were going to surprise them. You were gonna you you were gonna ambush, and they ambushed you. No, no, we ambushed them, but they were surprised when the vanguard showed up, and they thought he was coming way before behind them. I see, I see. So with that, I knew that Che was there, confirmed. So I went to see Colonel Centeno. There was still two weeks for basic uh, graduation for the battalion. All the training was completed, and I told him we have to move the battalion immediately because we know exactly what that where Che is right now. So I convened the colonel, so they cut that uh, graduation uh, procedure, and they mobilized the battalion on the first, actually on the 1st of October, they were deployed. There were four companies in the battalion, one stayed in Valle Grande to support them with ammunition and food. There was one company commanded by Raul Lopez Leighton, a captain, to cover the Rio Grande, so he would move to the other operational area. One com commanded by Celso Torrelli, who was a captain who later became president of Bolivia, and he was a to, to help as a reaction to the company doing this the, the searching around, who was Gary Prado. It was amazing how far it, it went because it was the 1st of October. On the 7th of October, they have a campesino come back and told them that there were voices at Quebrada del Juro, that's where Che was. So on the evening of the 7th, they surrounded La Quebrada del Juro. And on the 8th, when they started advancing, it was a Sunday, Che was there, and that was the firefight when he was captured alive. And actually, 
when he faced our troops, he told them, don't shoot, I am shaved. I am worse to you more alive than dead. So they brought him to the, to the point of Ligueras. They communicated information to us. We didn't know at the beginning whether it was Shea or not, because they would say only Papa Cansado, which is a code uh, that the leader of the guerrilla was captured. They didn't know whether it was Shea or was uh, Inti Peredo, the Bolivian leader. So I flew in the back of one of the 86s and another head of operation, another one, and we confirmed it was the foreign, the Estrella Extranjero. How did, you, how did you do that? How did you confirm it? By radio. I had installed some mm -hmm. PRC-10 radios on this plane who didn't have compatible frequency before, and they told us it was the foreigner, it was Shea. So I came back to Valle Grande, talked to Colonel Centeno. We had a dinner that night. I brought a couple of bottles of scotch that I had bought for a special <laughs> occasion. And then I asked the colonel if I could go with him. Everybody wanted to go with him. So that day he dispatched Lieutenant Colonel Sellis to go down and secure all of Shea uh, pertenencia, all his uh, items and things. And then on the following day, he and I, we flew in the helicopter into Igueras. We arrived there about 7.30 in the morning. All these officers were in there. We got into the room. He was sitting like next to, uh, the, to the door with a little window on top, uh, tied his hand and, and, hand and legs were tied in the floor. And in the back of the room, there was two dead bodies of two Cuban captains. One was Oslo Pantoja and another one. So when we came in, I came with the colonel, three other officers. The colonel was the one doing all the talking. He took a chest or asked a question. Look, he didn't say a word, nothing. To the point that he got mad, he said, look, you are a foreigner. You are invaded my country. At the least, you can have the courtesy of answering me. Not a word. So he left. So I asked the colonel they could give me all his documentation to photograph for my government. So he ordered Lieutenant Colonel Sellis to give me a chest back. It was a, a bag like this, mm -hmm. uh, very thick, with camel color. Inside he had a German diary, a big book, of course, written in Spanish. That was his diary. He had some pictures from his family. He had some medicament for his asthma. He had some a very small code book, numerical, with blue around it, that we call One Way Path, from China. China produced that to him. And, uh, you know, and photographed from his family, things like that. So I took that to start photographing. Then I came back to the room. I stood in front of him. I said, Che Guevara, I'd like to talk to you. And he talked to me very arrogant from the front. I said, nobody talks to me. Nobody interrogates me. So when I saw that attitude, I said, look, I didn't come here to interrogate you. I'd like to talk to you. I admire you. You used to be ahead of a stay in Cuba and you're here because you believe in your ideals, even though I know they are mistaken. I just came to talk to you. So he looked at me for a while to see if I was making fun of him. When he saw that I was serious, he said, can you untie me? Can I sit? So I called a soldier at the outside and said, untie Commander Guevara. The guy looked at me and said, untie Commander Guevara. So we untie him, we sat in a little bit and we started talking. Cuba would say that he would say, I don't talk to traitor, and he uh, spitted on me. That's not the way it happened. There are some people from our exile here that say that he pledged that he was uh, afraid. That didn't happen yet. And we actually had a, a, a talking to each other with mutual respect. Every time I tried to talk something about uh, tangible, that we had to do with the tactical operation, he said, you know, I cannot answer that. But we did talk about different things. For example, uh, I was telling him uh, that you know, he was telling me about the Cuban economy because of the embargo. I said, Commander, that's ironic you tell me that because you were the president of the National Bank and you were the minister of industry and you, you are not even an economist. He looked at me and said, do you know how I became president of the National Bank? I said, I have no idea. So I was sitting one time with Camilo Cienfuegos. I understood Fidel was asking for a dedicated communist. I rose my hand and he was asking for a dedicated economist. <laughs> so, you know, I really, I, I did the same. I thought he was making fun of me. But later on, when one of his three, three of his survivors, Colonel Dariel Alarcón Ramirez uh, Benigno, he defected, he was in Paris. Uh -huh. Telemundo brought me there to an interview between two enemies. And then he wanted to talk to me in private. And that's absolutely true. He told me that he was there with Camilo and she understood he was asking for a communist. And that's a how he had the and, he his hand and he was asking for a dedicated Did he economy. acknowledge the friction with uh, Castro? No, no. No, but he never talked well, uh, well about Fidel either. He didn't mention anything about that. Then I asked him, why do you select the Bolivia? He said three criteria. One, Bolivia was a very poor country. And he would believe that an imperialist United States would not be interested in Bolivian economy. If it was Venezuela, yes, because of the oil. So that's one criteria. Second, the army was very poorly trained. And he was right. The first combat that he had, the soldiers would throw their weapons. They were captured. They were taking the weapon from them, give them one hour indoctrination, take all his uniform, his boots, and send them back with their underwear. And third, most important to him, he had boundary with five different countries. If you could take Bolivia, it was sure, easy sure. to export the revolution in those five Con countries I already oh, made, sure. mentioned. So what happens now? I mean, he's... he's uh... Well, I am coming back and forth. I don't know what's really going to happen. And then I got a call for, from, the, uh, from one of the late uh, persons in there and said, there is a phone call 
uh, for the highest ranking officer. I had the time, I had the rank of captain with the Bolivian Army. There was only two lieutenants there. So when I went to the phone, they say 500, 600. That was a very simple code that we developed. 500 check, 600 kill him, 700 keep him alive. So they repeated 500, 600. It was when Centeno came down and said, coronel is ordered from your high Bolivian command to eliminate the prisoner. The order from my government is to try to keep him alive. He said, Felix, my name was Felix Ramos. Say, Felix, we have worked empirically. We're very helpful. Thank you to you. But this is order from my president, my commander in chief. He looked at his watch and he said, the helicopter is going to come several times, bringing food and ammunition and taking our wounded and our dead. But it's after two o'clock, it's going to come back. And I'd like you to bring me the dead body of Che Guevara and you can use the CIA in any way you want because we know uh, how much harm you have done to your country. So I said, my coronel tried to make them change their, their mind, but if they don't not change mind, I give you my word of honor. I will bring you back the dead body of Che. And he left. And sure enough, the helicopter came back uh, doing that. And, uh, that's why the picture was taken, because the pilot came with a camera from the head of intelligence and told me, Capitan, Major Saucedo want a picture with the prisoner. So I look at Chase Commander, do you mind? He said, no. So we took him out and gave my camera to him. And actually, when I put my hand around Chase and say, Mira el pajarito, you know, look at the little bird that was said to the kids in Cuba. And he started laughing. I thought that he was laughing when the picture was taken, when he was not. And then I, I got the other guy's camera and closed the lens and everything, because I knew that they were going to say, uh, that he was dying in combat, and I didn't want a picture floating around there. Was he alive with this major? And, and, and then he left. That's the picture that we have from there. So I started waiting more and more, and then finally, uh, there was a lady when I was finishing photographing the dart at about 12.30 in the afternoon. I said, Capitan, cuando lo van a matar? When are you going to call him? I said, Lady, why do you say that? He said, Look, we just saw you photograph with him in front of the of schoolhouse here. And look, she put uh, the pra uh, plastic radio that she had. The radius already given the news that he died from combat wounds, and he, he was still alive. So I knew at that time that it would not be a counter order. So I entered into the room, I stood in front of him, I looked at him and said, Commander, I'm sorry, I try my best. This order from the High Bolivian Command. That man turned white like a piece of paper. So he composed himself and said, it's better this way, I should have never been captured alive. Then he had his pipe here, he put the pipe out and said, I'd like to give this pipe to a soldadito who treated me with dignity. And at that point in time, Sergeant Tehran, who was the one executing the people, burst into the room. Yo quiero la pipa, mi capitán, I want the pipe. So I said, no, a ti no te la doy, I won't give it to you. So I have to order three times uh, Sergeant to leave the room. Finally, when he left and she had the pipe here, I said, Commander, will you give it to me? He thought for a few seconds, and he said, si, a ti si te la doy, I will give it to you. So I got the pipe in here. He said, anything you want for your family? Then I can tell you definitely that in a very sarcastic way, he said, well, if you can't tell Fidel that he will soon see a triumphant revolution in America. Uh, uh, say that again, please. Then he told, if you can't tell Fidel, he will soon see a triumphant revolution in America. And then he changed and said, and if you can, tell my wife to remarry and try to be happy. He approached me, we shook hands, we embraced, and he stood in attention thinking I was going to be the one to, uh, to execute him. And let me tell you, that was probably uh, a very difficult moment in my life, especially as a professional, as a CIA agent, because we don't kill people. At the same time, I thought what happened to my country when Batista released Fidel. And I thought this is well, order from a high Bolivian command you are not here to command, you are here to advise. That's their order, and let history and run what, itself. And what, tell, tell people, because there's a, in, in America, certain segments of America, there's a whole romantic notion of Castro, Hollywood actors go and meet with him, take pictures with him. Guevara, we have kids walking around with, you know, pictures of him like he's some kind of a... Hero, they don't know a, what Yeah, a brave revolutionary. Right. So during that period of time, what was happening in your country? What, what is it like? Can you explain to people what it's like in Cuba? No, it was still executing people and everything. They total control of, of everything. But I want to tell people, uh, uh, Mayor, uh, one example who really Che Guevara was. Beside the fact that he publicly said that it would be worthwhile to throw an atomic bomb over New York and have millions of innocent people die to be able to implement socialism in this country. Okay, he has said that in the past. But I'll tell you one example so people can really realize who he was. About a year and a half ago, there was a lady who visited our museum in Hialeah Garden. And she was the daughter of Lieutenant Castaño. Castaño was a police officer in Cuba for an anti-communist uh, unit. Eventually was executed. And she was visiting him on a Sunday at La Cabana Fortress. They, they arrived about six o'clock in the morning. They don't enter until about noon to be able to be in front. And she was fairly close to the front, about 11 o'clock in the morning. There was a lady in front of him that saw Che Guevara coming in his jeep, and she started yelling, Che, 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 and Che finally came and said, Senora, what happened? So she went to Che and said, look, my son is 15 years old. He's very young. He's in prison. There's two weeks that I don't sleep. 
please release him. He has done nothing. What's the name of your son? So he, she gave her the name of her son. He ordered one of his officers to go out and get her son and bring it over. When the son arrived, he hit him in the, in the, in the back, threw him in the floor. He said, USOB, your mother having a slept for two weeks because of you. He pulled his pistol and shot him on the head. And everybody in that line started yelling, asesino, asesino, comunista, you know, assassin, all of that. And that day, they stopped all the visiting for all the police, the prisoners, the people who were visiting them. That was the real Che Guevara and how cruel he was. And this is driven by this, this uh, obsessive devotion to socialism and communism. But, the, but as, besides that, he, a, he had an obsession about killing people. Yeah. But I recall, I had a friend called, le dicen el coreano, Miguel Asanche, who was the one who trained Fidel in Mexico. And we used to be together in the Dominican Republic at that time. He used to tell me that Che, when he was in training, we'll ask him because he was in Korean War and he had killed people in, during combat. And he asked, Che will ask him, what does it feel like when you personally shoot somebody and you see the blood coming out of him? He had a fascination. What do you feel when you do that? And then he wrote his father after his first execution that he loved what he was doing, that he really enjoyed executing enemies. So what was it like in Cuba then? Castro takes over. So we go from 1959 to this is 1967 now, right? Right. What, what's it like in Cuba? The same, a total dictatorship. You cannot say anything against the regime. Uh, there were hundreds of thousands of political prisoners during that time. The firing squad was still functioning. A lot of people got killed. So it was very difficult to be able to do anything against the regime. How did they, det did they use a firing squad for all executions? Oh, they, whenever somebody was against, and then the, the problem was also, because they were not professional uh, tribunals or anything like that. If there was a, let's say, a, a, a rebel from, F from Fidel's army, who had a personal problem with you because you, maybe you had a relationship with his wife, he will accuse you of being a Batista headman and they will execute you. And that's not normal. And, and they didn't have uh, such things as trials? No. Well, the trial was already predetermined. They already knew it was going to but be. You didn't good. have a lawyer. You didn't have. Well, when you have the lawyer, sometimes the lawyers say, you know, I have to defend this SOB. So, you know, it, it, <laughs> it was a system that is ridiculous. There was no legality in what they were doing at all. At all. What. Um... So t did you ever get to know what Castro, what was driving Castro? Power. He was not really a communist. His brother was a communist. Be Raul. Before Raul. Before they went to Mexico for training, Raul had visited the Soviet Union, but not Fidel. Fidel could care less about communism. He would select a system that will keep him in power forever. And he was, and he and he was quite wealthy. His family was and fairly he, wealthy. And he lived, uh, he lived a, a wonderful life. I mean, he had villas and... No, especially, especially after he became in Cuba, he owns everything. He right. had yacht, he had boat, he had a house in other province. He had like 80 different houses all over uh, Cuba. And actually, they tell me when, whenever he went to one of those houses, they had the food and everything ready for him with security, with a cook and everything. Meanwhile, it's been consistent poverty Absolutely. in Cuba. I mean, it's just, it's either poverty or abject poverty. Right. The, the 62 years, six, Absolutely. 62 years of third world poverty, and then worse. What I tell you, what, what I see right now, uh, Major, is now really, for the first time in so many years I have been following this, the people are up to here, all right? Before, there were what we call escasez, there were lack of food. Now there is no food. For the first time in all these 62 years, you find out that people are going hungry. People could eat before, even though they could not select what they wanted, mm -hmm. but not anymore. And people are dying for lack of medicines. That's another thing that is happening right now. Or forget about the vaccine, like this new administration claimed they wanted vaccine. You mean any, any medicine for anything? Yeah, they don't have anything. And well, one thing is really aggravating the whole situation is the lack of electricity. They are beginning to ration the electricity because they don't have enough oil from Venezuela anymore. And people had it up to here. And the significant of what happened in these few days in the past was that was one city who revolted without which is organization. Nobody had which, organized that. Which was that. the first one to... Uh... San Miguel de los Baños. Right. Okay. That's the area where the United States used to have a military base during World War II in Cuba. But then it spread. Yeah, but... The, no, Within the, hours, the, it the, spread the, all over the Yeah, island. but the, the important thing is that nobody organized that. A lot of times, you know, the local uh, anti-Castro people will call for... No, no, no. It was an, a spontaneous explosion of the city because they cannot hold it anymore. And what happened is those people started taking pictures with their, their telephone and sending it all over. 
And then when people saw that, they exploded voluntarily everywhere. Tell you that the situation in Cuba right now is up to here. It's the first time in, that I see in my lifetime that we're getting close to the, to the end. And the new president of Cuba, do you know anything about him? Well, he's, he's just, he's not popular at all with anybody, Diaz Canel. He just do whatever he, uh, Raul tell him to do. He doesn't even have the charisma. No. That the, I mean, the, uh, Castro, Fidel at least, certainly had a certain kind of charisma. No, this guy doesn't. That was uh, uh, remarkable, even though he was an evil right. man. Right. And he certainly fooled a lot of people in Hollywood and... Uh, Herbert uh, Matthews from the New York Times made him a hero yeah, in this country yeah, yeah. when how, they interview how, him. Do you have any idea? Do you know, have, no reason to be absolutely accurate. How many people do you think Castro had killed? Well, we have a memorial here. Yeah. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of, of crosses. It should be, it's, it's amazing. So this guy and, murdered... And there are other people that have been killed and nobody knows. And these are people that are killed either in the streets or in wars, or they're killed with these... Monthly in firing the, squad. With these uh, firing and these phony, the phony, the phony trials. Right. And yeah. now the reaction of the regime to this outburst was immediately to cut off the internet, right. close off the island, and then go into the streets and beat the hell out of people. Absolutely. And, and and we don't even know how many prisoners there are, right? Every day is more. The prisoners but, are held but nobody can incommunicado get in secret. Yes. Some, well, they, there are hundreds of prisons all over Cuba. Amnesty International can document 600. But a lot of people... Oh, say, they have a lot of more than that. Everybody tells oh, yeah. me from there that it must be three, four Because they don't, they don't put records. They don't put records. You cannot believe anything that they say. So, when, I mean, if, if, if things go like normal, we're really not going to find out what no. happened here for a year or two. We'll find out how many people are dead, right. how many people have been tortured. Right. A lot of them, you speak to the political prisoner here in, in, in Florida, and it's amazing the hundreds of thousands of people that went through prisons in there, what they had to go through. Well, let me ask you these things, because with all the experience you've had, there can't be anybody that has a better assessment of this than you do. How close is this to being able to overthrow the communist regime? It has never been so close. Cuba has been atypical. Everybody thought when the Soviet Union went down that Cuba was going down. It didn't. Because they have implemented a security apparatus that goes beyond the one what the Soviets are doing. They really control everything in there. And they put so many people in prison, they beat the hell out of so many people that people were afraid. But now, because of the situation, they don't have to eat, they don't have medicine, they'd rather die than continue they have under nothing the present to lose. They're circumstances. They're at the point where they have nothing to lose. Right. You got to the point that they say they better kill me than continue this. And there's fight. nobody now that can bail them out. Uh, Russia has tremendous economic problems. Venezuela no, has tremendous economic problems. No. China doesn't really bail you out. No. It, it ropes you in. Absolutely. Um, we have to find a way to, I, mean, I know we have the technology. We have to find a way to be able to have those people communicating through the internet again without control of the Cuban internet. Unfortunately, we have a, 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 a regime a regime and an administration in Washington that um, I was shocked at how, how uh, meaningless Biden's statement was. Uh, and also, I'm totally shocked at the fact that Cubans who are coming over right now are sent back when we let everybody else in the whole world come in, even if they have COVID, even if they're MS-13. We don't even check people coming over the border. Yeah. Uh, the, only people, the only people we're checking now are, are Cubans. Yeah that are fleeing communism. It almost seems like the, the, the Democrats have a soft spot for communism. Yeah, especially at the border, because let me tell you, here in the Strait of Florida, the problem is that if they open up, there would be an escape valve like happened in Mariel with Jimmy Carter. I know Mariel well. I, yeah, People the, are ready to explode in Cuba. And if you allow I, them I, to I come was, by the hundred and thousand, that I, would be a valve I was of the associate attorney general that had to deal with the aftermath of that for Ronald for Ronald Reagan. And that's oh, how absolutely. I got to know Florida. And, and it took a long time to, 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 uh, to work that out. But do you think that'll happen again? Mariel? Yeah, I mean, would, would, would this, uh, basically what Castro- I hope not. I a, hope lot not. Of, a lot of good people came in. Yeah, but, but a lot of bad with people it, But within in. the good people, they were able to hide the prisoners, the insane. We had them in the Atlanta penitentiary. I visited there a couple of times. They used to kill each other. But today, they were, they, a lot of them, a lot of them were not just criminals; they were criminally insane. Right, I, I agree. That that he sent over. Right, 
But heaven doesn't happen because otherwise it would be like a escape boat right yeah. now and people's pressure is so high on them that they feel okay. But can it be done? Can it be done without like uh, really strong support? The kind of support that a that a Reagan gave and and a, and a, the Pope and and Margaret Thatcher overcoming communism, or the kind of support that that uh, Trump gave to the Iranians. Right. Uh, basically, Obama turned his back on them in 2014. The but whole we never, thing died. We, we will never get that from this administration. Believe me. We will never get but that. But can it can it be done without that? It could be done, and especially if they are able to open the the red for communication, they can. They have. We have the technology to do it. How bad or how good is the attitude of the ordinary poor person in Cuba? Do they hate America because of the propaganda? No, no, no. I, 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 I've been no, told believe. most of the Cubans love the United States. Yes, I've been told that, and I hear it on the in interviews. And a lot of people have families in here. A lot of those people leave because of the families that are here. And so that's that's not the case. They, most of those people in Cuba love the United States. Now, how did they how did they get the American flags that they're holding? Oh yeah, they they they, they have they have way they did do it themselves in did there. Did you bring them in? No, no, but they they have it in there. <laughs> Let me tell you, they they normally get it down there. Yeah, I'm trying they, to. I'm, they are very. Uh, they can get a lot of things in down there, and especially now there is uh, this consensus of of freedom. Like you say, Cuba used to say "Patria Muerte," you know. Country yeah. or death. Now is patria, country, and freedom and libertad, vida, life. So the man who wrote that, or the man who actually didn't write it, he did the the um, the photographic work. He didn't write. He, he went to jail for a year. Oh yeah. They put him in jail for, for doing a song. They, if you put a caricature against the regime, they put you in prison. I guess he's lucky they didn't kill him, right? Oh yeah. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back for a few concluding remarks. Not long ago, Mike Lindell, the inventor of MyPillow, and his team fit me for my very own MyPillow. They also introduced me to their wide assortment of other incredible products, like their mattress topper, their sheets, towels, slippers, and more. Sleep is incredibly important to me, and I can assume for all of you. It's time you give MyPillow a try and see for yourself. Listeners have helped build MyPillow into the incredible company it is today, and Mike Lindell wants to give back to all of you. You can get great discounts on MyPillow products by going to MyPillow.com right now and seeing each of the specially priced items, including those in the Radio Listener Special Square. You're going to see rotational offers up to 66% off on products like their pillows, mattress topper, Giza sheets, but also new products like their slippers, weighted blankets, robes, and waffle blankets. All MyPillow products come with a 60-day money-back guarantee. Enter promo code RUDY for these great specials. That's MyPillow.com and use the promo code RUDY. We're back with the Colonel. <laughs> it's been a remarkable uh, story, and I deliberately saved for the end, just exactly what were uh, Che's final, final moments. You told us about um, his giving you, his giving you. Uh, yes, after he gave me the pipe and we shook hands and embraced, I just went out. He stood in attention, thinking I was going to be the one. Were you inside him. or outside of this? Place? Inside, inside the schoolhouse all the time. Then I came out, and right next to the uh, to the door in there was a Lieutenant Perez and Sergeant Teran, who is the one that everybody knew was executing the prisoners. Uh, so I got in front of the sergeant and said, look, this order from your high Bolivian command to eliminate the prison. Don't shoot from here up. Shoot from here down because he's supposed to die at the combat wood. Say, see me, Capitan, see me, Capitan. It was exactly one o'clock in the afternoon Bolivian time. And I left. I went to a upper little hill there where I had uh, a table. I was photographing the diary before. And at 1.15 Bolivian time, I heard a burst. Now I understand that Sergeant Terran came in and, and uh, he was the one uh, who shot Shea. At the time he shot Shea went like this, that's why he got a bullet through here, which is a normal reaction to cover yourself. So he borrowed an M2 carabine, which is full automatic from a Lieutenant Perez uh, next to him, and then he came into the room and shot Shea. How many shots? I would say it burst about three or four. And then did you go examine? Uh... No, I stayed, I stayed back for a while. For, and then later on, uh, close to four o'clock in the afternoon, two of the officers uh, Captain Gary Prado, who captured him, and Celso Torrelio came down. We all came into the room. 
Uh, when we saw his, his face was facing the, the ceiling, he was covered with mud. And we all went around the body. I recall Celso had a little a stick and he closed his head and said, USOB, you killed so many of my soldiers. So we sat around the body and uh, Gary Proud said, uh, said to me and said, we have finished the guerrillas in Latin America. And he told me, Capitan, if we haven't finished them, we have delayed them for a long time. So we could hear the helicopter coming. I left. I asked for a bucket of water. I went down. I cleaned his face from all the mud. And then I tried to close his jaw with my handkerchief, which I lose with the, with the wing of the helicopter. I tried to close his eye, but it wouldn't stay. It would pop up again. Then they had a stretch. We put him in the stretcher. I was in one side and then in the back of two soldiers. And he brought it to the right side of the helicopter. I remember tying it down in there when the Major Nino Guzman told me, Mi Capitan, move it forward to balance the helicopter. So I put my hand here. I pulled him out. And when I got it out, it was completely covered with blood. Apparently, he had a, a aorta was shot in there, mm -hmm. and it's a plastic uh, treasure. So I recall thinking, I never say a word, that there are people that have uh, blood in their hand. I had the hell of a lot of So I didn't throw anymore. I just cleaned the, the blood inside my pants, finished tying him down, jumped into the helicopter a little bit to the left to balance it. And then a soldier came and say, uh, and said, Father Chile, Father Chile wants to see him to the pilot. So we stayed for about three or four minutes. So here comes this Catholic priest on top of a mule, got very close. He almost got decapitated by the helicopter. Then he went down and he looked at him and he gave him the last benediction. I have a few pictures left with a mean of German camera. He gave so him I, the last, the last, the last yes. benediction. And I took some picture uh, when he was doing that and thought to myself, this guy, which is an atheist, he didn't believe in God. And nevertheless, he received the life of Richard yeah, from he the was, Catholic He was an antagonistic to God, right. not just not and, believing in God. And then we took off and we landed uh, at, uh, at uh, Valle Grande. When I arrived, there was nobody there. Now they had like 15 small planes, all the press all over the world, four military planes, all the generals were there. And when we landed, I, I put my cap down, I left. And then they took the body to the hospital, Nuestro Señor de Malta, in, in an all ambulance. Then in the evening, there was a meeting uh, in one of the uh, areas where the high command was in Valle Grande. When I arrived, as this uh, general was telling a, a colonel, if Fidel Castro denies this Che Guevara, we need tangible proof of it cut his head and put him for Malachi. So I said, Mi General, you cannot do that. I said, why not? I said, supposedly Fidel denied this is Che Guevara. You are a head of a state. You cannot show the head of a human being as proof. I said, well, what do you suggest? I said, if you feel so strongly about tangible proof of it, we have Che Guevara fingerprint from the Argentina Federal Police and they can be checked, cut one finger. So he ordered both hands to be cut. So both hands were cut, they were put in for Malachi, and later on the Minister of Interior, Argueda, who became disaffected with his own government, took the hand to Cuba. And Fidel kept the hand in one of the monuments of Cuba and showed the hand only a very high dignitary to visit him. So they, the hands are in Cuba. So do you believe that the elimination of, of, uh, of Shea did slow down the ability of Cuba to turn, like uh, the whole thing with the Sandinistas might have turned out different? Uh, had he been around? No, if he had been around, he would go to another country and do the same thing a lot of other people. But he seemed to killed. be one of these charismatic people that could make a difference in uh, leadership. Uh, uh, it seems to me that nobody really replaced him. After, uh, especially after he, he wanted to be his own leader. Yeah. He knows that in Cuba he's never going to be number one. So he wanted to be someplace where he can be like Fidel Castro was. And that so, never happened. So now we have... Finally, not a Castro in charge, even though Raul is behind the scenes. As long as Raul Castro is alive, a Castro is in charge. And do the people feel that? Oh, yeah, they know. Because I was wondering, maybe this, no, happened, that, yeah. maybe this happened because there's no Castro to frighten them the way he did in the past. That does a factor also, but the most important thing is that they are up to here. They have no food, they have no medicine, they have no electricity, and they cannot, uh, they cannot handle anymore. This is the final question, but not the end of the story. Are they going to succeed? Are the Cuban patriots going to succeed in overthrowing communism? I believe it will. I exactly, we don't know when. It could be days. It could be weeks. I don't think it's going to be years. Can it happen with Biden in the White House? It could. It could. I hope so. And the what, sooner, I, the better. And you base that on Looking your observation? At the looking at the desperation of the Cuban people and the way this thing was started. This is unique. And, and this was clearly a demonstration against the communist government. Oh, absolutely. This wasn't about sanctions. It wasn't about no, no, COVID. No, 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 no. They want freedom. They, and that's what they were claiming all along. They want freedom. They're up to here the way they have been living all of these years. 
finally they had it up to here and they're ready to go because they want freedom. They are tired of this regime for so many years. Well, we're all praying that it's true. And uh, I, hope, I hope that my government, for the sake of history and for the sake of the honor of the United States, plays a role in overthrowing communism. Absolutely. And I wanted to make, bring something before we leave, uh, Mayor. How concerned I am with this administration. Uh, I have been here many years, have been all my life since I came back from 1954. Uh, we always saw the United States uh, will never be able to go into communism. I remember Khrushchev said in the United Nations, we will take it from within. Remember that when he I said that in the United that. Nations. Uh, I am afraid it's beginning. And that's what I worry because I know what communism is. And there's a lot of naive people in this country that confuse uh, what they call um, uh, democratic socialism. No, what they, what they call progressives. Oh, progressive, yes, yes. They're not progressives. We know that. Progressives, what they are talking about is, is in the best of the cases, socialism uh, and communism. And we went through that one time. We don't want to happen a second time. That's why I tell you that the, the really this time, the 2022 election will be the most important election in the life of every American who wants to be free. If we don't control the House, if we don't control the Senate, we are going to lose the United States as we know it today. And I am 80 years, 80 years old. I have no place else to go. So I'll try my very best that that doesn't happen and we will continue to have a free United States America as we know it today. Well, I share your observation that we're on, a, we're on a, an express train to socialism and communism if someone doesn't stop that express train. Right. And it has to be done politically. Absolutely. Well, it's been a great honor. A pleasure, Mayor. If I can call you Felix, it's been a great honor. Absolutely. You're a great man. Thank you, sir. And you've contributed so much to liberty and freedom. I hope you get to see it in your I country. I hope I will. Hope to God you do. Thank you, I'll sir. I'll pray for that. We have to go there together. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. That would be, for me, that would be just an unbelievable culmination of something I've prayed for for 30, 40 years. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you.